with Jim and Joy. And you know, you are an important part of our EWTN Amen. family. And we would love to hear from you. You can send us an email during this live show, Jim and Joy at EWTN. Dot com. Well, hon, we have another great guest Absolutely today. Absolutely incredible. And his name is Dr. David Reardon. And he's the author of a great book called Making Abortion Rare, yeah. A Healing Strategy for a Divided Nation. And boy, is our nation divided yeah. over this issue in the church and out of the church. He's written several books. Uh, he's a real hero of hours when he came into the room in the back, I wanted to applaud and I did say yeah. bravo. Yeah. Because Dr. Reardon is just the, among the foremost experts in post-abortion healing work, the pain and suffering that women go through, men as well regarding abortion, trying in every way to say, hey, this creates a whole nother set of problems. If you're thinking about it, please don't do it and here's why. Mm -hmm. um, he has a great heart for the church and mobilizing the church to share on life. Um, he has model legislation to try and uh, make sure that women are very well informed about mm -hmm. the risks regarding abortion. Mm -hmm. So if you're out there today and uh, you've had an abortion, you're post-abortive, a man, a woman, um, there's hope and there's healing for you this day. So stay with us throughout this show. Well, this weekend we had the wonderful joy and pleasure of having our daughter, Anna, yes. who had to go to a teacher's conference, come to visit us. Yeah. And she brought her four beautiful children, yeah. Gabby, Sienna, Sophia, and RJ. RJ. Yeah. And um, one of the conversations, Anna, Anna's seven-year-old, Sienna's getting ready to make First Communion. Yeah. And so Anna, you know, was doing some home catechesis with them and teaching them the... Ten, Ten Commandments. Commandments, yeah. And so she's, you know, so she was going back and forth. Sienna say one, Sophia say one, Sienna say one, Sophia say one. So she comes to Sophia. So how old is Sophia? She's going to be five, yeah. but going on 80. Yeah. You know, she's, she's one of those kind of kids, real old soul. Sophia Wisdom, yes. Yeah, Sophia Raquel. And so Sophia is <laughs> thinking, and she's trying to figure it out, and she's thinking, and then she said, Thou yeah. shalt not be dumb. For one right. of the commandments. For yeah. one of the commandments. Yeah. So Anna goes, well, Sophia, that's not a commandment. And Sophia yeah. said with all of herself, well, it should be right. because people are dumb. Yeah. yeah you think of the, the Ten Commandments. You know, we should love the Lord our God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength and, and all the positive things. Then it gets to thou shalt not right. commit murder or adultery, or steal, covet. And so she says, thou shall not be dumb. Right. And while it's not in the scripture, I think it should be the 11th commandment. <laughs> it's a good one. Because after the 10 commandments that God has given us from his very heart and soul, there should be something there that says, don't be dumb. Mm. I've just given you my revelation, my word here to make you happy in life. Don't be dumb. Don't be ignorant about God's commandments. We need to teach our children the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. Summarized in loving God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength right. and our neighbors, ourselves. But don't let our children, don't let this nation be ignorant of the commandments of God. Right. Uh, don't be dumb. Or maybe we know the commandments of God and we're turning away from them. And, you know, don't be dumb. Don't be willfully ignorant because you experience such pain well, you when know, you deny the commandments of God. And, you know, it reminds me of the story when you were in jail, one of your many times. Why was I you in went jail? to jail for sitting in sitting an abortion, in an abortion clinics, yeah. clinics trying to... Help yeah. moms not to non violently their prayerful. Non violently. Yeah. But one time you were in jail, and yeah. when you were in jail, you were asked to do a Bible study. Right. And, um, and you were amazed, and this speaks of us at our society. You were amazed yeah. at the men who were 50 and over. Yeah. They had some awareness right. of, the of the Ten Commandments. Right. The guys who were 30 and under, they were dumb. They were clueless. Yeah. They didn't know the Ten Commandments. Yeah. They don't know. And you just and you were like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And so you started to teach them the Ten Commandments. The Lord gave me that. You know, I said, what, what can I teach you know, while I'm here? And this was uh, in the Fulton County Jail, which exists no longer. Mm -hmm. But it was like God to teach the Ten Commandments. And then after that, call them to repentance and ask them to renounce demonic power. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because we had a group of people from another religion around us who were harassing those guys that were coming to that study. But every night we do the Ten Commandments, we renounce evil powers and, and come to the Lord. 
And uh, the group grew and grew and grew until they threw me out of jail because mm -hmm. <laughs> right. there's so many people coming to it. So it was really, really powerful. Well, you were having a great impact, but it is. It's reminding us of the truth of God. Yeah. And then Sophia had this other cute little revelation well, that she shared. We don't got much time, but she was going to dip a hand in the holy water that we have by our door. The font, yes. The font. And so I said, you know. That I purchased at EWTNRC.com. I didn't know what she knew about That's it. So I said, one. you know, this isn't regular water. This is, so she put a hand in it. She made the sign of the cross and she says, oh, does that stay with me? Mm -hmm. In other words, regular water evaporates, but does this stay with me? And we want you to know that the blessing of God does stay with you. The sacraments stay with you. No matter how old, how hurting, no matter what sin you've committed, the blessing of God mm -hmm. stays with you with you, stays on you, you stay with him. David Reardon is up ne next, Dr. Reardon. Don't go away, we'll be right back. It's a very important and blessed show. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of the family, and we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for today's guest, Dr. David Reardon, give us a call during the live broadcast. And if you're in North America, call us at 1-800-221-9460 outside of North America. You can reach us at area code 205 Two seven one two nine eight zero, or you can always send us an email during the show, Jim and Joy at EWTN.com, and hopefully we could use your question on the air. Well, you know, as Jim shared in our opening, Dr. David Reardon, we're just thrilled to have you here. We use your material at our Pregnancy Medical Center mm -hmm. in Birmingham, Alabama, and so I just want to thank you. Yeah. I want to thank you for your passion on this issue. You've been at it for a while, and uh, our hearts are beating for the same cause. And I, you know, I want to thank EWTN because nobody out there in media world is having this conversation that we're about to have. So I want to give a great clarion call to the truth of telling us about the effects of abortion on women. And um, so why don't you tell us um, how a woman, when she has an abortion, being in an unwanted and rare, supposedly, the effects of that on her? Well, it can vary from woman to woman. I mean, every case is unique, but there's similar themes that happen all the time. So I guess if you want to break it down into two broad groups, there's the group of women who are maternally attached. I mean, and uh, if things were better, would be glad to be pregnant. If the guy was somebody they wanted to be with, if there was, if they, financially they had support, if their parents weren't upset, if, what, you know, yeah. if things were right, they'd be glad to have the baby. Mm -hmm. And so for them, abortion is more likely to have a more, uh, more negative effects more immediately, more quickly. They're going to have the sense of grief, loss, any sense of attachment that they have. So, for example, some women would say, you know, as soon as they became pregnant, like, Wow, I'm pregnant. I've always wanted to be pregnant, but all these practical reasons, I have to have abortion. So you know, the, the mind and the heart are in conflict right off the bat. So there's that group of women, and then there's another group of women, I suppose, who you can say low maternal desire. They've always been career oriented, never had any moral beliefs against abortion, and for them, when they find out they're pregnant, it's kind of like, wow, immediately abortion is is mm -hmm. the solution. And for them, usually it's after the abortion that they're suddenly kaboom, wow, that was worse than I thought. But if they have strong coping mechanisms, they'll put it off. And so on average, we found that it takes about eight years before women begin to deal with the past abortion. Mm -hmm. So some women will have immediate negative reactions. Others, it could be years later. Mm -hmm. And it could be uh, difficulty getting pregnant or when they do get pregnant or the death of a loved one or uh, even simply... Uh, when they retire and they're in their old age mm -hmm. and suddenly they're wondering what if my life had been different, you know. So different things will bring it back. I get, the basic issue, I suppose, is that we're all reflective people. At some point in our lives, we look back in our life and say, what if this or that? So you can't say any group of women are ever safe from not having yeah. problems. 
but some will put it off for a long time. For others, it will be really immediate, dramatic, or uh, like I said, some experience later when they first see their fir firstborn live child mm -hmm. and they see that baby and they realize, what did I lose before? Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of triggers mm -hmm. that can bring up these buried emotions. You know, it's interesting when you're speaking about um, some women that might be more susceptible to desire having the child if they had support and so on, and then this other group of women. One of the questions that we bring up in our counseling, which is kind of fascinating for me, is this whole area of what about adoption? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting with the vast majority of women who are coming in who are abortion vulnerable um, for whatever reason, when you bring up adoption, almost I'd say a good majority of them, wherever they're from, would say, I could never do that. Right. I which could to never me, which do to me is, is one of those... Uh, it's actually a risk factor. It, it's, it's signaling that in their hearts, yeah. they know I'm already feeling attached or I could become <coughs> attached or I'd right. be so attached I could never give the baby up for adoption. Right. But they somehow imagine right. the lie that by having an abortion, it's going right. to turn back the clock and you'll never be attached. Right. Well, they have the abortion and all those maternal instincts that yeah. were going to attach and not be able to give the baby are still going to attach right. to the loss in the memory yeah. of this right. child. And so they're still going to have the issues, yeah. uh, but they don't realize it. They, yeah. you know, that's the big lie. I, I, find, I find that question about what about adoption, even if the woman's there and, and is, is, you know, so, seems so hard regarding the opposite way, I think that's an opportunity when say, I can never do that to point out, you see, you're already bonding with the baby. Right. And that's a new awareness for them. And that really is, you know, an opening of the door to help them get in touch with where they really are, even though they're denying it or I've never taken a pro-life position right. or I've got a career, then why would you say you could never do that? What is it about you could never do? Who is this one that you're speaking about? Mm -hmm. So yeah. like you're saying, down deep within the deepest recesses, even if they're denying, there's a maternal instinct there, isn't there? Right, yeah. well, I, I, you know, like, uh, the big lie in abortion is that somehow, if you have an abortion, it turns back the clock and you were never pregnant in the first place. Mm -hmm. But that's not the truth, of course. When you have an abortion, you have now experienced the loss of a, of a pregnancy as opposed to actually having a baby. So once you're pregnant, it's not a choice between not being pregnant and you know, being pregnant. It's a choice between ending a pregnancy early and losing a baby or carrying a baby to term that you now take care of. Right. So, you know, in their minds, they're buying into the lie that if I have the abortion, it won't be like placing a child for adoption because it will never have been there. Right. But they discover later on that, no, mm -hmm. that's, that attachment is still there. You know, when God puts a child into you, you're already a mother. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's just a question of whether you're going to lose that ch child to a miscarriage or abortion or adoption or you're going to raise the child. But, you know, there, there's these paths where th there's some relationship and it could be a loss. And every woman who's suffered a miscarriage knows, right. you know, there's that loss there's this pregnancy. loss and, yes. and society doesn't quite know what I'm mm -hmm. going on with, you know, but there, you know, everybody, I often say, you know, when, here's another little trigger, for example, this is a common question, do you have any children? Mm -hmm. For a woman who has had miscarriages or abortions, they know they have, but they usually don't say, here's how many abortions or miscarriages I've had, mm -hmm. they say, the, the living children, because they know that's what people are generally referring to. Mm -hmm. But in their heart, the question, do you have any children? Yes, I've got three children, plus the two I aborted, in parentheses, right. and the one I miscarried, or whatever. So it's a relationship there, and, and you can't really uh, avoid it just by pretending it doesn't exist. When a woman um, believes the lie, because there's so many lies out there about abortion, when she believes the lie that I'm really just going to solve a problem. Um, tell our family at home the lie about that in her mind, and then really uh, the whole new set of problems that she creates, because you know she's because everyone's telling her you don't want to hurt your family, you don't want to, uh, you have your career or you're in school or he's not the right guy, this isn't the right time, you know, whatever that list might appear to be for all those reasons to go, I could just do this and then I'm going to hit the reset button and I'm good to go, right? right? Um, how, how really does that affect her? 
Well, again, it, it's going to depend a lot on the, on the different individual, but for some women, for like you described, if there's a big long list of people telling you all the reasons why abortion makes sense, mm -hmm. that's a young woman who, part of her, you know, as one woman wrote, she, uh, she told everybody she wanted to have the baby, but everybody kept listing all the reasons why she should have the abortion, and mm -hmm. pretty soon she felt like she was being crazy right. to want to keep it. And why I called her, she's socially aborted. She's been socially cut off from all the support people who are supposed to be going, yay, we're here to support you. Mm -hmm. She's hearing, are you crazy, are you crazy? And that drains her sense of confidence and makes her feel alone. And again, the classic example is, you know, the husband or boyfriend who says, if you have this, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. You're being forced to choose between your love between one person and your love for your, your, your unborn child. And that's a terrible, unfair choice to put someone into. Right. So, you know, again, so you've got that mm -hmm. dynamic where, where, as one woman put it, she made a choice to be weak. She let other people make the decision for her because she <clears throat> didn't have the strength to stand up against all these pressures, all the nuances. For example, rape and incest abortions. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, actually, best evidence shows that only half of the uh, rape victims have abortions. And we have a book called uh, 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 Victims and Victors where we've interviewed over 200 women who had mm -hmm. rape or incest pregnancies that had either abortions or carried terms. And most of the ones who had abortions are often doing so because they're being pressured by the people around them. Well, you, if you're even thinking about having this baby, then maybe you weren't really raped. So even the, even defending the, the position, they're put, you know, everybody's assuming the doctors, well, you need to have abortion. So even though in their hearts, they're struggling with this yeah. because they've just been victimized. In fact, I've, I've found that a lot of these women who may have thought before, well, I'd have an abortion if I were ever raped. Once the rape is in the past and now they're faced with a pregnancy, now they're victims. And now they're, they're, even their mentality, the way they look at it is, well, how can I do this to my baby? Mm. So it's, it's not like women who have a, a, a rape or incest pregnancies automatically want abortions. And there's not any evidence they benefit from abortions. You've actually researched this? Oh, yeah. We researched we have a, a book that. right on yeah. yeah. So the, one of our books called Victims and Victors yeah. has the testimony. So all of the women who had carried the term say that was the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Virtually all of the women, except one who had a, 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 a abortions, said that it caused more trauma and made things worse rather than better. Mm -hmm. Okay, and even the even the one was fairly soon after it, so she is still trying to piece her life together. But the point is, you know, that the you know the, this idea that abor abortion again is going to be a magic wand that turns back the clock and, and it doesn't help a woman recover from the trauma of rape. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it's more do more trauma. It just adds another, another trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, PTSD on top of PTSD. There's layers of of trauma, so. Uh, and we, we do want to say to people, if you're out there right now considering abortion, you're not alone. If you've had an abortion, we're here for you. People are here for you. You can go to 1-800-712-HELP. You can call that number, 1-800-712-HELP, or optionline.org. That's optionline.org. You are not alone. There's a whole family of people that want to assist you on either side of it, considering abortion or your post-abortive. We're here for you. Dr. Reardon, as I'm listening to you speak now, you kind of said some, you've painted some scenarios where, like, the society is saying to this woman, you know, how could you not do this? It almost becomes a cultural pressure. Yeah, and maybe you can speak to the various forms of pressure. You speak about unwanted abortions. We've heard of mm -hmm. unwanted pregnancies. That's a phrase everybody seems to know. But you speak about unwanted abortions. What, what are you speaking about there, juxtaposed right. to the other one? Well, there'd be a couple of phrases. So, so one, one study of uh, women at health clinics in the United States found that of those who had history of abortion, 64% felt pressured by other people in their lives to have an abortion. Another study found that, you know, again, probably about 70% feel pressured by circumstances, mm -hmm. okay? okay? So again, you know, for a woman who, whose first reaction, if, if your life was more ideal right now, would you want to have this baby? Many would be, be like, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I, could, you know, I would love mm -hmm. to have to have children. So others, at the, so it used to be abortion was, before it was made legal, abortion was an act of uh, wealthy women after <coughs> they'd already given birth to children and there's kind of a late pregnancy that was mm -hmm. like, oh, no, I, you know, I'm right. older, I'm not ready for another one. You know, I, and it's, so abortion was at the end of, the, of a woman's reproductive life cycle where mm -hmm. they were like, I don't want any more children, mm -hmm. instead of at the beginning of reproductive life okay. cycle. So now it's the early pregnancies that are, tend to be aborted. 
Uh, so it's really been uh, turned upside down. Incredible. Um, you've worked with legislation in a number of areas. Have you worked mm -hmm. with legislation in this area of coerced abortions and women's rights or counseling centers, right. what they could do to help these women understand what's going on? Yeah, well, we have a different approach than some, some pro-life groups have tried to pass laws to make it illegal to coerce a woman to have an abortion and to require the clinic to put up a sign saying, you know, but anyone who's good at coercing somebody, that sign's not going to stop, right. right? And often the coercion is very subtle. And you get, for example, one girl said, you know, she told her mom that she wasn't going to have an abortion uh, and her mom changed her mind with four or five words. Where will you live? Mm -hmm. Right. And suddenly she's like, mm -hmm. I had no right. choice. Right. So, you know, it's the, you know, the, then you have other cases where the coercion literally is a boyfriend threatening her with physical violence if she mm -hmm. doesn't have the abortion, her harassing calls every night. So there can be a whole mm -hmm. range of, right. of violent coercion and even attack. In fact, wow. the number one cause of death among pregnant women mm -hmm. is homicide. Right. Okay. So, you but know. Say that again. The number one cause of death among pregnant women is homicide being killed by boyfriends or, yeah. or husbands, some, some, some mm -hmm. husbands mm -hmm. somebody <coughs> who, because she's carrying the pregnancy to term, yeah. it, he doesn't want to be f f stuck with child support or whatever. So, I mean, you know, again, it's so, wow. and you know a lot of these cases don't end up in homicide, but they end up in, in one security guard at an abortion clinic said that it wasn't the pro-life protesters who were the greatest threat to these women, it was the boyfriends, because he could tell mm -hmm. when the boyfriend's dragging her mm -hmm. in, making mm -hmm. sure she's going to have the abortion. Right. So, you know, th so there's, but there's the subtle coercion, there's just the subtle pressure. Like, well, you can do this if you want, but, you know, we won't be able to help you a whole lot. Right. Yeah. That's the kind of pressure, right? So anything along that, that uh, continuum can lead women to have an unwanted abortion simply because they feel they have no choice. That's the big lie. You ask that, women about pro-choice, most of them say it wasn't, a, I didn't have a choice. Right. right. It's good. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will have more with Dr. David Reardon, Healing Strategy for a Divided Nation. You can go to his website, afterabortion.org, or stopforcedabortions.org. We'll be right back, so don't go away. Welcome back. Well, first of all, EWTN Religious <laughs> Catalog has a new compilation of Mother Angelica's straightforward solutions to life puzzling problems. And it's put together in a book form with the help of Christine Allison. And it's called Mother Angelica's Answers Not Promises. And you can order it by going to EWTNRC.com or by calling 1-800-854-6316. Now, Dr. David Reardon has a great book, and it's, he's the author of Making Abortion Rare, A Healing Strategy for a Divided Nation. And if you sit yeah. down in, with your family or your coworkers and you understand just how divided our nation is on this issue in the church and out of the church, right? And so that would be a, a great book and a great read yeah. to arm that conversation. Well, Dr. Reardon, you speak a lot about the repercussions of abortion uh, on women, but the American Psychological Association says this, and I quote, there is no credible evidence that a single elective abortion of an unwanted pregnancy in and of itself causes mental health problems for adult women. So it sounds to me like a layman. It's saying, hey, if women are having abortions, there's nothing that proves there's any repercussions or ramifications. Right. There's that, no credible evidence that a single elective abortion of an unwanted pregnancy in and of itself causes mental health problems for an adult woman. Yet you seem to be saying there are difficulties, there are problems. Or, or maybe I'm misunderstanding this quote. Well, that, that quote was very you well... You want the quote? No, no, <laughs> no sure. Uh, that quote was very well crafted yeah. if you read the entire report. Okay. It was crafted to, get, to give exactly the impression like you said. Yeah. But if you break down the actual quote, it says no credible evidence, meaning there is evidence, but we decide it's not credible, 
that a single abortion, meaning they admit that multiple abortions, there's evidence, cause problems. Okay. And over and ha over half women having abortions clinics, having abortions today, have already had a prior abortion. Right. Right. Of a single elective abortion, meaning they admit therapeutic abortions when there's uh, any problem to the baby or a health risk to the woman, more problems, psychological problems. Of a of a, uh, of an adult woman, they're admitting that for minors it's higher. Higher. There's a couple other qu yeah. qualifications. Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And the, all, one of the big things also is in and of itself, they're arguing that you know there's no proof that abortion is the sole cause of the women's problems. Right. right. There's plenty of evidence that contributes to the cause. When you have a woman who commits suicide and she leaves a suicide note that it says about you know the abortion two weeks before, right. abortion contributed to that. But we can't prove that abortion was the sole cause of her. Yeah. Breakdown. So, mm -hmm. so it's a very nuanced statement saying, if in effect, that for the minority of women having abortions who are adults who haven't had a prior abortion who have strong psychological health, there's no clear evidence that abortion in and of itself will cause problems. Right. That's for the minority women. Mm -hmm. So they're really admitting. You read the report; they even list 15 or more risk factors that predict which women are more likely to have problems, mm -hmm. like feeling pressure to abort, having moral beliefs against abortion. Uh, being a uh, teenager, having prior mental health. And if you look at the percentages of women having those things, 80 or 90 percent of women have multiple risk factors mm -hmm. who are okay. having abortions. So okay. the, the APA is playing this little word game, right. trying to make it sound like, oh, don't worry about it, folks. Even though you read the full report, yeah. they admit some women have problems, and these women who fall into the majority of women are at risk. Yeah, this is a very important point that you're sharing and something that I've not delved into enough. I understand in speaking with women, helping them who've had abortions to speak about possibility of post-abortion syndrome and here's some of the, the uh, outcomes and what they look like and so on. But you're mentioning risk factors up front that some women could be even more susceptible to difficulties and problems if they do have an abortion. And that's something that we don't hear a lot about. Addressing women before it happens, are you, is the uh, psychiatric association, did they understand that? that oh, they're, they're, they're admitting well, why, mm -hmm. why, why don't we say this has to be addressed with women, even if it's their choice? So we're not saying end abortion, we're just saying we're accepting, not really, right. but we're accepting that this is the law of the land. We'll never, uh, and, uh, and if this is the law of the land, why aren't you addressing S some women that might be even more susceptible to a bad outcome regarding right. this. Yeah. Everywhere else in medicine, they screen for risk factors. Mm -hmm. That's why when they list a drug on, t on TV and they're telling you all the risk factors right yeah, and there. Yeah, you're like, why do you risks, want to take that drug? And they say to talk to a doctor mm -hmm. because the doctor's job is to look through your risk profile. You may say, oh, I need this drug because it'll help me sleep better. And he says, but you're diabetic, it can kill you. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to know more than you do, even mm -hmm. though you think this is supposed to help you. Mm -hmm. He right. knows more. Another elective surgery, LASIK surgery. Just because you want LASIK surgery doesn't mean you automatically deserve or should get it because the doctor will screen for you and they reject 20 to 25 percent of uh, patients because they know exa after examining your eyeballs you're not going to get the good results you want. Oh, right. Only in abortion do the doctors say, well it's not up to us to know whether or not it's going to help you or not. Mm -hmm. But it should. Under the law, under Roe v. Wade, it said basic responsibility rests with the physician. The physician is expected to uh, ethical physician mm -hmm. to screen for these risk factors and make a risk benefit assessment and say, I think abortion in your case is going to produce most, more benefits than, than harm, right. and so I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. That's what's supposed to take place. But basically, they wash their hands of it because they don't want to take the time to do proper screening. And unfortunately, and this is what our law tries to address, unfortunately, they face no liability right now. In the common law, you cannot sue for psychological injury unless there's also physical injury. So they're hiding behind that barrier in the common law. But there's no reason we can't pass a law to allow women to sue for psychological injury because there's plenty of evidence to show that abortion is associated with psychological injury. One study done by Finland's national government found that the risk of suicide in the first year following an abortion was mm -hmm. six times higher than the risk of, of suicide following a birth right. and three times higher than compared to women who had, were not pregnant at all. So, you know, the link between abortion and suicide has been proven time and time again, but they don't screen for, risk, for uh, suicide risk uh, at abortion clinics. So, right. you know, we do need to make the doctors liable for making, giving good medical records, for acting like doctors. Mm -hmm. One a guy, a friend of mine said, you know, that before abortion was, uh, that a, the only difference between, I'm, I'm blanking on it now, 
but that. That's okay. Um, That's okay. Yeah, we don't have to uh, yeah that. but anyway, so the, the, the doctors need to be expected to act like doctors to do proper screening and counseling. Yeah. And because they can't even give good, how can a doctor give a good medical recommendation right. unless they ask about the right. risk factors? Right. Right. So, so they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to avoid. That be, whole conversation. Be, be, uh, they're mm -hmm. trying to avoid being doctors. They, mm -hmm. they really perceive themselves as technicians. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whatever you want, we do, instead of whatever you want, we will help you evaluate whether or not this is better, good for you or not. Right. That's what they should be so doing. So in, in one of your books, do you have a list of those yeah. that might be, it might be more risky for them to do this? And the Psychiatric Association has also developed yes. a list? Yeah, I mean, and so, so, so like, how do we hold them accountable to say, Everybody knows what the list is, and, and we're not saying this is going to end abortion. It's saying you have abortion. Why aren't you screening properly? Right. So, so the, what you have to do is you have to put the list into statute. Mm -hmm. okay. Because otherwise, the abortion, basically, a plaintiff would have to come in and find another abortion provider to, to testify against the first abortion gotcha. provider saying, mm -hmm. oh, we screen for this all the time. But the standard of care has gotten so low right. because their whole goal is to make abortion cheap and uh, mm -hmm. cheap. Mm -hmm. So you need to put in, if you put into statute that if you fail to screen for these things, then right. it's negligence. Now you don't have to bring in the expert witness saying this because it's in statute. Mm -hmm. And again, any do in doctors, the research, everywhere else in medicine, the screening takes place. So right. even the most liberal judge is going to have a hard time throwing out a statute that says doctors who fail to screen for these well-known risk factors that even the APA recognizes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm can't be held uh, liable. So, you know, I, I, even yeah. Ginsburg, I don't understand how Ginsburg, because if she st tries to create Supreme a, Court Justice yeah, Ruth Bader e Ginsburg. E yeah. Even if they try to craft a constitutional right to be, to waive your right to be screened for risk factors about something you don't know, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. kind of like, how, mm -hmm. y y right. y they would destroy all of medicine if they came out with, uh, with a ruling that basically says doctors can't be held liable for mm -hmm. how, you, bad medicine. You sound like, you have a degree of confidence that this can definitely put into, be put into statute and passed, yet we've seen what just happened recently with the Texas law, which is bringing up to standards uh, abortion mills mm -hmm. uh, to meet the same standards as, as other you know, clinics that are doing right. surgery and so on, and that got struck down. Why do you think that uh, there may be this, uh, better this hope? Yeah. Well, for this one in particular, looking at the justices that we have, Justice Kennedy, in a prior ruling has already expressed concern about the psychological health of abortion on mm -hmm. women. Okay? Since this has to do with the psychological health of abortion, and again, it's based on clear risk factors, and you know, the science is stronger in our, in our basis place right now. With the clinic regulations that they were passing in Texas, it was less clear, for example, you know, having the emergency equipment online. See, the abortionist control the data about reporting what takes place in their clinics mm -hmm. in the first 24 hours after an abortion. Since they control the data, they're hiding the number of complications. And they went to the Supreme Court and said, oh, there's hardly any complications. Right. Therefore, it's unfair to make us have to have wide yeah. hallways mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for gurneys or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so they're controlling. So we have more control over, and we certainly have more data. And certainly, I think we have the empathy of, 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 of Kennedy. But even more fundamentally, it's not an undue burden to ever screened for risk factors. Right. Everywhere else in medicine, you fill out a form, the doctor asks you about things. It is a proper burden mm -hmm. to good medicine right. to get proper screening and good counsel. Right. So, so it fits well within what the Supreme Court said. Now, yeah. who knows? That, right. I guess at, to, at the end of the day, I want to see what the other side can try to argue because I, I've looked at this for 20 years. I've talked to a bunch of attorneys, a bunch of doctors. None of us have ever come up with how they're going to argue against mm -hmm. <laughs> Looking at risk yeah. factors. So have right. you developed model legislation yes, yes. for this? And what has happened with that thus far? Right. So that's, that model legislation is at stopforcedabortions.com. Okay. And it's called the Protection from, from Unsafe in, uh, Abortions Act. It would require screening. It would require the doctor to also uh, list his evaluation of, 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 of these things. And it basically, the, the key is that it gives women the right to sue not only for psychological injury, but if he fails to do the proper screening, she can sue for the wrongful death of her child. Because if basically right. you, mm -hmm. you, you, you try to, we're trying to basically make it easy for women to hold the abortion clinics accountable. Because right now, only one woman in the whole United States has ever won a lawsuit against an abortion clinic because of psychological injury. Mm -hmm. And again, that's because the law disfavors 
that. So you need to put into statute that in the case of abortion, you are allowed to sue for psychological injury. And that Planned Parenthood has already said that if it, if it went into law, they'd stop doing abortions mm -hmm. yeah. because they don't want to face the liability. Right. Yeah. Well, we have a phone call. We have Janet from Arizona on the phone. Janet, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Dr. David Reardon. Yes. Uh, this happened 44 years ago. Prior to that, I had had... Um, twins and they're fraternal twins and they're alive and doing very well uh, ten months later I had an ectopic pregnancy but it was not understood when the doctor examined me and told me that I was pregnant again uh, within a short period of time I had intense pain throughout my whole body I could not even feel my nails or any part of my body without screaming in pain. The next day, I had no pain. And I called the doctor, and he said, you have an ectopic pregnancy. He said, I will make arrangements for it to be aborted. And... That's what happened, and I wanted to know how the Catholic Church understood this. Okay. Janet, thank and you. I thank you very much. Thank you so much for trusting us and, and sharing this tender story with us. God bless you. Doctor, your thoughts? Yeah, well, under Catholic doctrine, that wasn't an abortion. Uh, they, they would remove the uh, tube that was where the ectopic pregnancy, so they're removing the, the diseased organ not with the intent of killing the baby, but with the intent of saving your life. If today we had the technology to transfer that baby into an uh, uh, artificial uh, mm -hmm. womb so mm -hmm. to survive, you would try to do that. So you, you did not have an abortion in the sense of what, we're, what the church is talking about, uh, where it's a, cho a choice to end a life. Right. Yeah. Uh, you, you had a uh, ectopic pregnancy, and it's uh, treated totally differently under the double effect in, in Catholic right. theology. And in reality, in the ectopic pregnancy, the baby cannot even survive in the fallopian tube because it needs to be into the uterine it, cavity. It right? may have been dead already. If, right. if, if, given what you describe as the experience, it could have right. ruptured yeah. the, the, the tube. But so You mentioned anyway. the, the principle of double effect so th they were going to relieve this situation to help this woman and in the process there was another effect with the baby's demise um, but it, there's something here though about ectopic pregnancy and trying to repair the, the damaged uh, tube uh, which is a, it's gonna have to happen anyway versus going directly in because you can go in and and dissolve that that little one. So this is a very difficult thing when you're going through this. But if we were going through this, I would say if, you know, I, I would rather the surgical procedure, once you go in and say, we're going to directly go after this little embryo and, and dissolve this embryo or whatever, then you go into a different area. So there's yeah. different ways of dealing with an ectopic pregnancy, and it needs to be that surgical one and repair of that tube. Well, Dr. Reardon, we have Mary on the phone. And Mary, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Dr. David Reardon. Thank you. I would like to know if um, there is, has been any discussion or wonderment about how an abortion affects a boy or a young man after the abor abortion or in the decision of having an abortion. Good question. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, Thank so, you. May I hang up here? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes, um, men can have psychological uh, reactions and long-term uh, uh, problems associated with abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, uh, for gin men, different situations, sometimes the man feels guilty because he pressured towards the abortion or he wasn't supportive. Other times he didn't want her to have the abortion and he felt totally out of control. He begged her not to have the abortion and she did it anyway. So there can be all different kinds of reactions, but uh, men definitely... Uh, can have problems. 
And again, there's post-abortion healing programs for men. There's also post great programs for couples. Often mm -hmm. it's very good for a couple if they to go through post-abortion healing program together so that they understand each other's loss. Uh, so whether the man wasn't involved in the abortion or if he was, or if the woman wasn't involved but her husband was involved in the abortion, it can be a really uh, strengthening thing for a relationship to mm -hmm. work through the grief process with, with your partner. Uh, right. Because uh, so, uh, but to briefly answer the question, yes, uh, there is research that it can impact men and often impacts men um, and, and couples. What, what are some of the programs you're thinking of when you say there's some great resources for people, what would you recommend? Well, if you went to our website, uh, afterabortion.org, we've got links to programs, some for men, and I know uh, 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 Rachel's Vineyard does a yeah. weekend retreat treats that mm -hmm. they often have couples in, uh, do it, yeah. so that's what I was thinking about, right. couples. Closing word, Dr. Reardon, to all of our family out there to encourage them. Well, again, uh, do not ever give up hope that God's grace will move and bring Amen. healing into your life and to a loved one's life who may have been involved in a past abortion. We need to wear our compassion on our sleeve and make clear that, you know, the pro-abortion side wants to make it look like pro-life Christians are hateful people, that, we, you know, that we're judging people out there. No, we understand many of us, in fact, m many post board of women and men are now in leadership positions in pregnancy centers and pro-life movement because, you know, they're there to try to use their experience to help others. So never give up hope. God wants you to find healing. God uh, is reaching out with a desire to heal you and uh, draw you in and, and help you to move on. It's not about forgetting the pain. It's not about, in fact, one of the greatest temptations is that the devil makes women feel like they have to hang on to their guilt because you owe it to that baby to feel mm -hmm. guilty. And, and, and we need to, you know, again, all those who've been th through post-abortion healing will help you f go through the path of realizing, I don't have to hang on to the guilt. I can hang on to God's forgiveness and look forward to being reunited with my child and, and know that growth and healing is the proper way to show respect to both my child and to what God is offering to me. Dr. Reardon, thank you thank for your you. decades of work and compassion. Thank you for loving them both, the baby in the womb, the mother, and for leading us to develop a new culture of life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll have Father Leonard with us. So don't go away. You're at home with Jim and Joy, and we'll be right back. part of the family and you know we would love to have you join us live right here on at home and to be a member of our studio audience all you need to do is contact the EWTN pilgrimage department by emailing pilgrimages at EWTN.com or give them a call at 205-271 2966. We would love to have you here on At Home with Jim and Joy, and you could meet our guest. You could meet Father Leonard. It would be a wonderful time. Well, Father Leonard, Hi. welcome back. Hey. It's good so to good you. to have you. Yeah. It's always nice to be here. Yeah. Always good to see you. It's always and, good uh, to see you. Happy Feast of St. James, Thank uh, you Jim. so yeah, much. Yeah. You know, this Great is a very Saints important feast day. feast day. Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. St. James. Mm -hmm. What a bold St. James the Martyr. Guy. First yeah. martyr, right? First really? martyr, that's right. Beheaded Apostle and, for the faith. Yeah, very faithful and close to the Lord. Mm. You know, one of his chosen. Amen. Yeah. His mama said, right? Yeah, his mama wanted said. Wanted to write, wanted to laugh. laugh. Yeah, he was a mama's boy, him and John. You got to admit that. They were, they were mama's boy. Yeah. You have their mom, you know. And she was trying to make a <laughs> way for them. Advance them, you yes. know. <laughs> yeah. Jesus is right. <laughs> they leave daddy very easy. You know, it's evident. They just leave him in the boat, but mom follows him, and yeah. they stay with her all the way. Yeah. It's so, I've got uh, yeah. an image of St. James mm -hmm. right by my door that a good yeah. friend gave to me. And so it's always so good just to look at him before I go for my walk yeah. every day and my run and then come back in. Oh, yeah. And the Fellowship of the Saints mm -hmm. is just so, so wonderful. Oh, it's very important, especially, especially St. James, you know, <clears throat> a very courageous man and, um, again, loves the Lord and, yeah. you know, will do anything 
You yeah. know, that he's got he's got this this zeal about him, yeah. and uh, and that's what we need. Is uh, you know we're talking today about uh, with Dr. Reardon, mm -hmm. you know, a very impressive interview by the way, yeah. but uh, but we need this type of courage in entering the the pro life movement mm -hmm. and. With Dr. Reardon, it was just just an astounding man. We're, the, mm -hmm. the church, humanity is blessed to to have uh, such an expert as mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. You know, him who uh, who knows uh, or is is an expert in all areas of the pro life movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, um, in, in prevention and healing, and then you know, uh, from from the perspective of, of uh, you know psychologically, mm -hmm. uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Right. You know, it was, it's just astounding, amazing. Yeah. He's yeah. written a, a book called The Jericho Plan yeah. some years back. Mm -hmm. And that book is just so instrumental in mobilizing the church and compassionate mm -hmm. love and in building a culture yeah. of life. The Jericho Plan, excellent for the laity, mm -hmm. for ministers. Yeah. And he's got Forbidden Grief. There's a book, mm -hmm. Forbidden Grief, which he co-authored uh, with yeah. Dr. Teresa Burke, oh, yes. who's a colleague of ours back with mm. Priests for Life. And we go back to this book again mm -hmm. and again yeah. and again, because as you're doing this work you know, in, in mm -hmm. our pregnancy medical center, you're dealing with all sorts of women and every case yeah. is kind of unique, and especially in the area of repeat abortions. Oh. Well, why are there repeat abortions? Yeah. You know, over about 50% of repeat mm -hmm. abortions, and then why do we have four, five, seven, I dealt with a girl who had 12 abortions. Mm. What's going on psychologically? What's happening? And mm. uh, doctor speaks about in that book uh, why there's a dramatic mm -hmm. reenactment of the situation sure. and entering back into this again to mm -hmm. try and get control of the situation, but you're not totally healed up. So you're okay. trying to do something different, but you go mm -hmm. ahead and do it again. And it's just helpful to understand to some degree what's mm -hmm. going on psychologically That's right. and so on. So we could say, what are we dealing with? Mm -hmm. How do we break the cycle mm -hmm. of this? And Dr. Reardon's work is yeah. like profound in that area sure of, of being able to help these people who are mm -hmm. going in this way to get a grip yeah. on what's going on, to really deal with it, to make resolution with it for themselves, for their, their child. Right. And once they do that, then this, this behavior stops. Right. And so he's giving us the tools to heal the culture. Right. And his you know, view is, I think, I mean, he's, is that we can end abortion mm -hmm. through transforming you know, humanity and the women and sure. understanding what's going on so they That's can really right. make the choice for life. And that's what's really struck me is, uh, you know, the side effects of, of an abortion. I mean, and, and of course, in all areas of the human person. And this is what he brought out here. You know, in any medication, any medical procedure, uh, you hear about the side effects. You when you watch the commercials and all that, give you a long list of that. But they don't do that for abortion. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I never thought about that. And, you know, it's very important that he brought that out because it just speaks of the atrocity of it all. You know? Well, I would say to anyone viewing today, uh, there's all different uh, ways of being involved mm -hmm. in the movement, and there's a good group of people that are really involved in the area of legislation right. and the development of laws that help to protect mm -hmm. women sure. and build a new culture of life. Mm -hmm. And this would be something you want to look into, because Dr. Reardon was saying, mm -hmm. this is kind of standard procedure with physicians to go through the risks about this procedure, mm -hmm. and if this is a good procedure for you or not, you're more susceptible mm -hmm. to problems. And this is something that's really passable, it seems. Mm -hmm. He's got the model legislation, so mm -hmm. it's something to look in state by state. You certainly would be interested in it here mm -hmm. in the state of Alabama, because it really is, is not the abolition, mm -hmm. which we hope for, of, of mm -hmm. abortion. But even if we abolish it through law, yeah. there's still going to be abortion. Sure, yeah. But he's saying, while the situation is what it is, mm -hmm. people need to make an informed consent. And the more and more they get informed about what, what they're about to do and the ramifications mm -hmm. for them, and not only the child, uh, when we have that conversation, life wins. That's right. Again and again and again, life mm -hmm. wins. Uh, World Youth Day is yeah. upon us. Oh, it is. Uh, we have uh, uh, the EW10 crew out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Father Mark is with them, and uh, okay. we heard from him uh, the other day. He was on his um, uh, connection flight, and so uh, so yeah, this is exciting. You know, the Holy Father coming out, and uh, you know, all these youth from all over the world, and it's it's just a wonderful things to see, and it's inspiring. You yeah. know, that uh, they come out to worship God. Yeah. Go to ew10.com, to right? Yeah, you can get the whole. Right. But we need to be praying for everybody mm -hmm. assembling there. M right. Probably mm -hmm. over a million people or so will be mm -hmm. assembling there. And you mentioned the young people. Oh, young people. What a great opportunity mm -hmm. for massive and yeah. sweeping conversion, mm -hmm. vocations, right. priesthood, mm -hmm. sisters, 
marriage, family, right. divine mercy, and outpouring mm -hmm. of the mercy of God. Because we look at our country, at the world, and mm -hmm. you can almost despair, and we should never despair. And this yeah. is an opportunity for renewal and an That's outpouring right. of the Holy hope. Spirit in Poland. And you know? hope. Yeah. yeah, which is, mm -hmm. have you ever been to a, a World Youth uh, I've Day? I've been to a few of them. Mm -hmm. I went to a World Youth Day in Germany in 2005, and mm -hmm. then uh, in 2008 in uh, Sydney, Australia. Mm -hmm. You were a mere youth not long ago, then you got ordained. <laughs> yeah. This is it, right? You grew up right away. Yeah. Well, I'm not that young. You know. yeah. yeah. Bless your heart. No, but they're but, saying that yeah. there's going to be like two million. They were really oh, estimating yeah. Yeah, like yeah, there two always million. is. There's yeah. always, yeah, it's, it's yeah. amazing to see all those, those young people there. And all over there's, the world. There are, most of them are, are really on fire and mm -hmm. they, you know, they're, they're praising the Lord and, um, and they come back inspired and they bring that to, you know, to, to their countries, back mm -hmm. to their countries, the cities and the neighborhoods they live in. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful work of God. Father, why don't you yeah. close out our time sure, with a blessing. Sure. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for your goodness, <coughs> for the love you show us. And God, we especially lift up to you the youth at World Youth Day. We ask you, Lord, to inspire them, uh, to touch their hearts, Lord, and to inflame them so that they may go forth and glorify you. And may Almighty God bless all of us with his peace, with his mercy, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember, Thank you're an important God. part of the family. You're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.